like to welcome you to the panel discussion, The Shaping of the American Character, representing the Remnant Trust Conference held here at IPFW on Saturday, January 31st, 2009, and sponsored by IPFW and the Madge Rothschild Foundation. This is the culminating event for the American Character themed portion of the Remnant Trust exhibit here at IPFW, which started two weeks ago with the airing of the American Character Words of Change program. I'm Ann Livshiz, Assistant Professor of the Department of History here at IPFW. I would like to thank those of you who could make it here today for the talk um, and those of you who are watching the broadcast. It is my great pleasure to introduce the four panelists today who are going to be discussing the various aspects of what it means to be American. Uh, first is Andrew Downs. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science, director of Mike Downs Center for Indiana Politics, and the IPFW coordinator of the American Democracy Project. He's currently doing research on the recent developments in the field of voting strategies and technologies in the United States. He's the author of a number of articles about American politics and a frequent commentator and local and national media on Indiana politics. For this panel, uh, Professor Downs will talk to us about the historical development of the American political and social character. Next, we have Craig Ortsy. He's the visiting instructor in the political, depart uh, political science department at IPFW. He's a PhD candidate from IU Bloomington completing his dissertation, Labor Mobility in Central and Eastern Europe, before and after the EU accession. Uh, you can also see, catch him in the reruns of the American Character Words of Change program, uh, possibly still running on, uh, on, uh, on TV. Um, for this panel, Professor Ortsy will talk to us about the contrasting or maybe similar views of the American character from the inside perspective as exemplified in the Federalist Papers and the outsider perspective as exemplified in the Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. Next, we have Elizabeth Lemon. Uh, she's a senior who will be graduating from IPFW in the spring of 2009 with degrees in history and women's studies. During her time here at IPFW, she has presented for the last two years um, research papers at the IU Undergraduate Women's and Gender Studies Conf Undergraduate Conferences. And this year, her paper has been accepted um, to this year's um, IU Undergraduate Conference, where she'll be talking about Janice Joplin and counterculture in the United States. Uh, she is also the student representative to the Women's Studies Programming Committee. Uh, for this panel, Elizabeth will be speaking to us about sexism and the new left in the 1960s, in particular women within the Students for a Democratic Society and Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And last, but certainly not least, is uh, Professor David Schuster. He's an assistant professor in the history department at IPFW. He's the organizer of this illustrious panel. He studies cultural and medical history and is currently working on a book manuscript about neurasthenia and chronic illness in the late 19th century America. His op-ed piece, How Does One Define the American Character, appeared in the journal Gazette on January 26. Uh, for, the, for this panel, Dr. Schuster will be speaking to us about the importance of the frontier in the shaping of the American character. So the, um, our plan is that every panelist is going to talk for about 20 minutes, and after all the panelists are done, we should both have time for questions for our panelists and also um, perhaps a lively discussion, which one can argue is also an important part of the American character. First up is um, Andy Downs. Thank you very much. I, I do want to say I might be more interested in hearing the paper on Janis Joplin than what I have to talk about here, but <laughs> I'll have to go to that conference, I guess. Uh, when David asked me to present as part of this, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to talk about, uh, and then luck uh, fell into my lap, and in the Journal Gazette, I found a, an op-ed piece that was written by David. <laughs> And he actually wrote, casual observation shows the United States has a unique character shaped by its systems of government, education, and economy. Further inspection also reveals a national history, immigrant experience, and popular culture that sets it apart from other nations in the world. And I thought, ah, now I know what I'm supposed to talk about. So I'm actually going to go all the way back in time. I'm going to take us back into the 1700s, and actually even before that, and talk about a little bit the founding of the United States and how that has shaped the character at the time and still continues to shape the character today. Uh, I have actually a couple of points to make uh, about the time and place, and then uh, other comments to make after that. But I want to start by talking about how the United States actually is a creature of the time and place in which it was created. In other words, if it had not been the middle 1700s, could we have formed the government that we formed? It's a legitimate question to ask. And I think that there are two factors to look to here that say that that was a unique time and place that allowed for this. Number one, it was a, that we were relatively isolated from the rest of the world. If you were in the United States or the colonies at the time period, you not only uh, took a long time to get from place to place within the colonies, whether that was all the way up in the north or all the way down south, 
that was a long travel distance for you, literally days or weeks to get from place to place. But the thought of actually getting back to England or someplace else in Europe was an even longer prospect. And so that isolation helped uh, form our character in ways that I find sort of interesting. Uh, we also had a very low population density at the time period. So not only was it a long trip from A to B, but there were not a lot of us living in close, compact quarters. And this also is part of what led to, to what we consider to be the American character today. Uh, the, the low density and the long distances of the time period are actually interesting because the, the folks who are in favor of forming the federal form of government we have today, the Federalists, uh, they were primarily, I shouldn't say primarily, uh, Craig will correct me later on when I say primarily, but they were very concerned about the formation of factions, of groups of people who get together and act on their own interested behavior, uh, behalf without thinking about the common good, which of course is contrary to our concept of government here, that government is there to do uh, what's in the interest of the common good, that Republican virtue in other words. Uh, but they thought that part of the reason that we could avoid factions in the United States was because of this massive distance between groups and a, a complete lack of any sort of mass communication technology. So in other words, even if you had several other people who agreed with you on a particular issue, in order to get together, you had to travel great distances and endure great hardships, quite frankly, in order to come together to push that agenda forward, whatever that agenda was. And that is something that, quite frankly, made it possible for the Founding Fathers to say that the factions will not be the downfall of, of uh, the United States if we, if we were to accept uh, that, uh, that concept of federalism. But we were also a settler society. So not only were we isolated from everyone else, but we were a settler society. And this is sort of uh, something that's uh, very intuitive. You think about the fact that we came from other places, or a lot of us. We were relatively isolated from one another within the country itself. Uh, but we had a certain sense of rugged individualism, especially as you move off of the East Coast into even Pennsylvania, certainly into Indiana and further to the West. It's always been rugged individuals who moved out there, willing to take a chance to try and be something or take advantage of, of an opportunity that others weren't necessarily willing to do. People had a great faith in their own ability or perhaps delusions of grandeur about their own ability to survive on their own, provide for themselves, etc. And so this sense of rugged individualism and, and faith in our abilities uh, are part of what shaped us and still shape us today. We still think this very much. Uh, if you go into rural parts of the United States today, you still find uh, very much that sense of, I can take care of myself, my neighbors will help take care of me. You still find that in urban environments as well. Uh, but of course, what we mean by rugged individualism today, a little different than what we meant back in the 1700s. Although the people who were those rugged individuals heading out west, or for that matter even coming here, uh, they were not necessarily literate or weren't the most literate people in the world. They were, however, familiar with the concepts of that, that people like uh, John Hobbes or Thomas Hobbes and John Locke were talking about uh, that influenced people like Jefferson and, and the other uh, founders of the country. Uh, they did have a belief that they could make their own decisions for themselves. And if you look at the colonial time period, you find a number of examples of representative democracies or representative governments, I should say, already in existence. You find that in Virginia, you find it in Maryland, you find it in the town uh, meetings that took place in the northwestern part of the United States. So we were almost predisposed to liking the concept that we then eventually embraced. Uh, Next, I want to talk a little bit about our transition to democracy and how that was um, also somewhat uh, made easier by our situation, the time period and the place in which it, it took place. So for example, we had no monarchy here to depose. We had no, granted we were, we were revolting, uh, we did not like the king, we wanted the king to, and, and the king's uh, ideas to go away, but there was no physical person here that we literally had to go remove which made it a little bit easier. When you think about the distance and the lack of communication, it's a little bit easier to sort of ignore some rules and wait for people to get back to you than it is to actually have to go face to face with somebody and say, no, we don't like your ideas and literally throw them out. So that, I think, is something that eased the transition to democracy. We also had no real long-term or long entrenched government here that we needed to overthrow. Uh, it's not like uh, if you were to look in Europe or other places where the, the existing government at the time had been there for even 50 years, 100 years, 200 years. That was not the case here. 
So we had no specific individual to remove. We had no uh, really uh, deeply ingrained idea about the structure of government, which uh, helped us uh, move move beyond. And then perhaps most important and the one that we're most familiar with is we had very legitimate complaints about what the government was doing, uh, they would have argued to us, uh, the government would have said for us, uh, because they were unresponsive. It took so long to get answers back, the structures, the, the uh, ideas, the laws that were being imposed on the colonies were viewed as unfair, out of touch with what was actually happening here. And so the government could legitimately be labeled as unresponsive and uh, in many respects uh, counter to what was happening here, uh, not something that was going to allow this area to grow and prosper. Once again, a feature of that relative isolation and the fact that we were a settler society. So along with having these people who were experiencing this, there were people who were reading the great works uh, of the time period and earlier. There were people who had read Plato, uh, who uh, Plato understood that we actually as individuals, we can't survive on our own. We actually need other people. We, we form groups because there is this natural desire to sort of uh, divide labor up so that we can engage in those, as he put it, distinctly human endeavors, those things that allow us to recreate ourselves uh, and not just work. In other words, uh, to use a, a, an expression, no man is an island. You can't survive on your own. You need other people. Uh, and that's part of the reason governments form. That's why we come together and form communities, because we need those other people. You have people like Thomas Hobbes who, who said uh, that we actually have a right to everything, that we are constantly in a war of all against all. Uh, but since we fear death, not a bad thing to fear, by the way, uh, we actually <laughs> decide to come together uh, and, and, uh, and sort of defend ourselves against the war against each other that we, that we can have. Uh, of course, uh, Hobbes unfortunately thought that the best form of government then was actually an absolute monarchy, which is a little counter to what we were looking for, but we can set that aside. We can take the parts of Hobbes we like and ignore the parts we don't like. That's the nature of uh, what academics do sometimes. You have people like John Locke who said that, you know, it, it, life, uh, Hobbes actually said life is nasty, short, and brutish uh, if we are left to our own devices. Uh, Locke said it's not quite that bad, it's really more inconvenient. And the moment that we realize that we are better off with government than without government is the moment that we decide to form a government. But the key is that the government is formed out of uh, some sort of uh, agreement, consent, on the part of those who are going to be governed. So you take those thoughts, the, and the Founding Fathers were familiar with those thoughts, and they realized that this was, this was a nice set of theories here, because it was a theory not only of government itself, but also a theory of revolution. Uh, if you keep in mind that uh, whether it's Plato, Locke, or Hobbes, more so Hobbes than the other two, uh, there is implied in that that if you don't like what government's doing, you can decide to overthrow it. You can decide to do away with it because you have consented to be governed. If you, if you don't consent any longer, then obviously the government is invalid. You can change it if you wish. The Founding Fathers found this to be a remarkably convenient theory and also one that quite frankly, is, is interesting and, and very compelling. So uh, this unique philosophy was then used as the basis for uh, a small document called the Declaration of Independence. You can see uh, copies of different documents that we'll all be referring to over in the library at, on, the, on the campus here at Helmke Library. Uh, and I want to read a little bit out of the Declaration of Independence to demonstrate how those philosophies that I just discussed, which were so ingrained in the people who were living here, but also understood by the, by the big thinkers of the time, are evident in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the first sentence, and I always tell my students, don't ever write a sentence this long because you probably can't, but it, here it is. <laughs> when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should, should, should declare the causes which impel them to separation. I actually read this uh, in my introductory political science classes. I read it and I ask the students what it means. And even when I go into middle schools and high schools, I will often read this statement and ask students what it means. They never understand it in its totality, so we break it down. So what does it mean when we say when in the course of human events, et cetera, et cetera? And in the end, uh, middle school students, high school students, college students all seem to understand that this is basically a really eloquent Dear John letter. We are breaking up with somebody. <laughs> That's what it comes down to.
but we are obliged to tell people why we are breaking up. Uh, and that's basically what that first sentence is about. Next is sort of this uh, uh, overarching concept. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In other words, we're all entitled to those things. And since we are all entitled to them, government should not be there to limit what we are doing. They're setting a base groundwork for uh, not only explaining what people were doing in the United States, those who had, who had come here from other countries, those who were exploring out to the West, uh, but, but uh, what everyone should be able to do, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. They're not, if we don't consent, there cannot be government. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute a new government. It is our right to overthrow the government when it is no longer helping us meet those goals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In fact, you could make an argument that we are compelled to do that. And when we overthrow that government, it goes on, we must lay the foundation on these principles uh, that were just mentioned. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. In other words, you can't just throw the government out because there's a little disagreement. You have to work within the structure of the government to try and change the government because it is yours. If you aren't willing to play your role, then really there is no point in, in uh, accepting this idea that government exists because we consent to it. We are obliged to play a role in the process. And if we don't, that's our fault. It's not the fault of government. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations uh, pursuing in invariably the same object to throw uh, us into some nasty situation, uh, we then are obliged to, uh, to go ahead and, and structure a new government. In fact, they said that's what the colonies were obliged to do at that moment. So this document, this, this uh, unbelievably important document, after this wonderfully eloquent introduction, is nothing more than a series of 20-some paragraphs that lay out the specific problems that the colonists had with the king. Uh, and if you read through, I mean, the, the parts I've read, most of you have heard parts of these statements before uh, or even read it yourself. But after this, the document gets kind of boring, quite frankly. Uh, it gets to the sort of governmental speak that you might expect to hear at the time period about meetings being held at places that were inconvenient, that laws are passed that don't benefit the country, that hold us back, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the Declaration is a wonderful argument, a persuasive argument, that had to convince the people living in the United States, well, colonies at the time, that breaking away was the right thing to do. But it had to do it in such a way that would convince the global community that this was the right thing to do in sort of a unique set of circumstances. It would not have been in our best interest for France and Spain and Russia, other, other colonial uh, uh, countries, uh, countries with colonies, to decide that we were being sort of uppity because it would have been in their best interest for us to be quelled uh, and shut down because their colonists might start making the same argument. So we had to make a very legitimate argument based on sound philosophy with real examples of why we should be allowed to do this. Uh, fortunately, it worked. Uh, and we were able to not only break away, but have had some, some luck since we got here. Uh, additionally, uh, there have never really been the sort of social cleavages, divisions that you find in a lot of other countries, uh, whether you're talking about race, uh, religion, ethnicity. We still find this today in a number of countries where there are political parties that form strictly to support a particular ethnicity, a particular religion, a particular race. We've never really had that here. While we have, believe me, had plenty of problems here, we've had plenty of cleavages, none of them as deep and severe as what we see in a lot of other countries. And that's actually been sort of to our benefit in terms of forming uh, our government here uh, and our identity here. Uh, some of you uh, will, will know uh, what, what uh, Cray's going to talk about, uh, democracy in America, elected to Tocqueville. One of his observations, and I apologize if I'm taking one that you were going to talk about, <laughs> was that we're a country of joiners. We belong to organizations, and that's still the truth today. We belong to a number of organizations. If I asked you, I'm sure most of you belong to more than one, whether it's a, uh, an interest group like uh, the NRA or the Brady Campaign, uh, whether it's a political party. We belong to stuff. It's natural for us to do that. And that actually helps to minimize the cleavages that exist because we belong to so many organizations where we're, there, there are no specific issues that really divide us. And instead, 
there are a lot of little issues that kind of help to bring us together in ways that are sort of interesting for us. Uh, and so uh, I will conclude uh, very quickly by pointing out that the political parties that we have uh, form in part uh, not because of those cleavages, not because they're representing the interests of a particular ethnicity or religion or race, but instead usually for power reasons. Uh, we go back, if we go back in time, we can go back to 1824 when, as uh, his supporters would say, Andrew Jackson had the election stolen from him in the House of Representatives. Uh, others would say, no, we just followed the process. There's no, no stealing going on here. The first political parties, other than the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists arguing about the ratification of the Constitution, which was very specific, the first political party that formed was actually the party that was there to help get Jackson elected. And it was a populist movement. It was a group of people who wanted to see the, 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 the ideas of the people represented in government. In other words, following through on this concept of popular sovereignty that, that uh, the country was founded on. So even when political parties have formed, it's typically been simply to gain the, the position of authority and power, not to represent a particular ideology. Earlier this week, uh, John Hostetler, who was a member of the United States Congress representing the southwestern part of Indiana, was here on campus. And he actually said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, the Republican Party needs to decide if they are the conservative party or the party that simply wants power. And that can be true, that can be said of virtually the, the two major political parties throughout time because the positions they advance have varied a little bit over time uh, based on what sort of the needs of the people have been, or more accurately, what they needed them to be in order to gain power and authority. So I think that uh, is a good basis, uh, starting point, from where the American identity comes through. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'd also like to thank everyone for coming out on this very cold morning to uh, a conference on the American character. Uh, what I'd like to do over the next 20 minutes or so is discuss uh, two of the most uh, important foundational works in not just shaping the American character, but describing the American character. As Professor Lipschitz said, one of these is very much an insider perspective, the Federalist Papers. These were uh, 85 letters to the editor, literally editorials, that were written to defend the Constitution, basically explain what this new document was all about, and answer many of the important objections to the uh, Constitution. This is considered a big description of the American character because we see the, what the United States is all about in our Constitution. Um, the idea of having a limited government, the idea of having uh, a free electorate that picks that government, and having power split, not just uh, see power not just at the national level, but at the local level as well. Lex de Tocqueville's Democracy in America is written about 50 years or so after the Federalist Papers are written. Uh, the first uh, revolutionary generation has now passed away, uh, they're, or at least are out of political power, and now a new generation has come into power in the United States. And the question is, how well are they keeping that revolution? How well are they keeping the uh, parts of the American character that are described so well in the Federalist Papers? In fact, um, Tocqueville uh, quotes directly from the Federalist Papers several times in Democracy in America, just to kind of demonstrate how important uh, fed the Federalist Papers were, even from the very beginning. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of talk about some of the elements of the American character that both books discuss, both the good and the bad parts of the American character, uh, and then discuss some of the similarities that they have there and some of the differences they have on those, on those points of view. <clears throat> Probably the most important part of the American character that both books discuss in a similar fashion is the idea of American exceptionalism. This is the idea that uh, the United States is uniquely placed, both historically uh, and geographically and in a lot of other ways, to, to create a democratic country right here on, in North America. Almost from the very first sentence of the Federalist Papers, you get this sense. Uh, when Hamilton's writing about how uh, the United States is a unique entity and that we're, uh, we've been destined, I mean, it doesn't say by God, but it's kind of implied there, uh, we've been destined to answer the question whether it's possible for people to write rules for themselves that last. In other words, is self-government possible? And it's up to the United States to 
determine that for not just us, not just for North America, but for the world at large, all of humanity. Can people make rules for themselves that last? In Democracy in America, he comments on this, on this very idea, by saying that for the last 50 years, all Americans have been told that they are uniquely placed to uh, determine whether free government can actually last, and that the United States is a special place. And de Tocqueville kind of takes a very neutral position on this. He neither says that yes, they are, no, they aren't. Remember, de Tocqueville's coming from France and uh, outside the United States, so he might have a more I don't know, maybe jaundiced view of this. But he certainly doesn't say that the Americans uh, are not, but he also says that he also doesn't say that, that we are as well. But again, this idea of American exceptionalism has been a big part of American politics for a very long time. He said both of these works at least comment on this comment on this idea. Probably one of the things that's noted the most about both books is their uh, noticing of or their notice of uh, how much Americans like local government and like power kind of spread out, not just focused in the focused in these central areas in this in uh, the days of the. Um, Federalist Papers would have been New York City or Philadelphia. You know, Washington, D.C. didn't come around for a while, but also at the, also at the local level. As Professor Downs pointed out, um, the United States was a uh, frontier society. Uh, mo the distances between places were large. It made sense that Americans would want to keep control over their politics at the local level because asking for help not just from Washington but from the state capitol would have been very difficult or almost impossible. Tocqueville goes into New England town meetings and writes extensively about how it is that Americans are basically running their own affairs at the local level and he's really impressed by this. This is not something that he's seen in not just in France but in most of Europe. You know, If there's a problem the question is you know, send a message off to the provincial capital or send it off to the, to the king and the national capital and ask them for help. But Americans don't do that. Americans will organize themselves, work out that problem at the local level, and not just uh, don't depend on, but in some cases don't want uh, interference, which is what they would call it, from the national or regional authorities. Additionally, um, and kind of going along with this, is that both authors talk a lot about the Americans' desire for a limited government. So again, one that doesn't, uh, one that doesn't intervene in their daily lives a whole lot, that doesn't have a lot of power, and you know, most of the powers are reserved to the people. And kind of going along with this is their desire for uh, low taxation. Again, this is part of, and this is, I think, part, a big part of the American character. Nobody likes to pay taxes, but Americans tend to like pay taxes less than others. In a number of Federalist Papers, the authors have to kind of strike down the idea that this national government is going to be this big, expensive extravagance, and that they're going to basically take resources, not just from the individual, uh, individual farmers or artisans or merchants, but also from the state and local governments. In fact, they have to kind of knock down this idea that having a national government with the ability to tax is going to basically shut down state government entirely, that this whole constitution is a power grab. And again, they basically have to explain, like, no, no, I mean, it's going to be very small, very limited government. Yes, the national government will have its own army, but this doesn't mean that the national army is going to uh, walk into the states and, and take them over too. Again, it's all about, it's all about local control. <clears throat> but in Democracy in America, you see uh, very similar arguments or very similar discussions there where he notes in a very surprised way just how small the national government is in the United States. Again, this is 50 years, this is 50 years down the road, and if there were going to be this great expansion of national government, we would have seen it already, but the Tocqueville says that this hasn't happened. That again, the New England uh, town meeting, the uh, township government, not just in New England, but in, in the other states as well, is really where the power and the control is. And again, it's a, it's a small national government. This is not what he's used to. In, in France, the national government would have had the majority of the power and control. And again, that's very different from what he's seeing in the United States. <clears throat>
Interestingly enough, uh, one of the places where they both see uh, a, a positive aspect of the American character is in its judiciary. Um, both uh, the Federalist Papers and Democracy in America discuss in, in some detail the importance of trial by jury and how this acts as a check on the power of the government, that the people themselves determine whether individuals are guilty of a particular crime or not, or determine which side is correct in a, in a, in a civil case. Um, the uh, other big surprise for Tocqueville anyway, although again this isn't really talked about in the Federalist Papers, is electing judges. Uh, this, is, this is a completely foreign concept for de Tocqueville. He doesn't really, he's kind of, again, very surprised by this idea that uh, individuals who are there to interpret the law should be elected by laymen, basically. And again, this acts, not, this acts as a, a check on the power of the government and is, again, a big part of the American character, limited government and that desire for control over, um, desire for contro control over individual politicians in this case. <clears throat> and I kind, of save, I kind of save the best for last year, in a way, in terms of the positive characteristics of the American character, which is that both books describe uh, that democracy is going to last in the United States because of the habits of the heart that Americans have to keep the republic going. Um, that's, again, probably one of the most famous phrases out of democracy in America is this idea of habits of the heart, that people understand what it is to be a democratic citizen. And although both the Tocqueville and Hamilton, Madison, and Jay, who are writing the Federalist Papers, might be unsure whether uh, this is uh, completely committed to by the American people, they both hope that this, um, these habits of the heart or Republican virtue as the authors of the uh, Federalist Papers would have put it, uh, was going to last. Now, one of the other similarities <clears throat> that kind of discusses perhaps a negative aspect of the American character is that both uh, de Tocqueville and the authors of the Federalist Paper discuss the idea of the tyranny of the majority. That, um, okay, Americans do have, uh, do have these habits of the heart. You know, they're a very, uh, very positive outlook on how the American character is going to look. But there's this danger of giving the average person maybe too much power, and that the uh, and that this majority power will end up being uh, restrictive on the rights of uh, minorities, uh, by which the authors were uh, by which Hamilton, Madison, and Jay were definitely talking about political minorities, but in again probably one of those famous passages of uh, Democracy in America. Uh, also racial and ethnic minorities too. Probably the most read part of Democracy in America is the section on, as he puts it, the three races that inhabit the Americas, by which he means Europeans, uh, Africans, and Native Americans. And as I said, this is probably one of the most read parts of Democracy in America because what he has to say about it is very prescient. It says that this, is, that this is an issue that the Americans are going to have to deal with. This is obviously a negative aspect of the American experiment. And again, something that they're going to have to uh, deal with, but he doesn't see how they're going to be able to. Um, he talks, de Tocqueville talks very openly about the possibility of conflict over the issue of um, and what to do with, uh, again, Native Americans and African Americans. And this is 30 years prior to the Civil War, where, of course, the, this, all of this came to, came to a head, at least in the 19th century, anyway. Again, this idea of tyranny of the, tyranny of the majority, the, the idea that giving people too much power might actually lead them to, um, uh, lead them to abuse it, also gets into the idea of limited government. If the majority gets too powerful, then, well, uh, the limits that you put on the government are good because it prevents them from, again, using the rights of, of the minorities. And again, this is, uh, as I said, a negative aspect of the American character that we've had to deal with for a long time. Now, although I've kind of talked about a lot of the similarities that exist between the two documents on the American character, there are a number of important differences that exist in, um, in their views of uh, this, important, this important idea. 
One of these is the need uh, of Americans to export the idea of American democracy. As I said, um, <clears throat> this idea of American exceptionalism is a really is a very important one to understanding to understanding the American character. But the Federalist Papers have a much more positive view over whether the results of the American experiment can be taken to other places. Again, going back to Federalist One, pra pra practically the first paragraph of the um, of the book states that we're an example to the world. Right? This is something that the rest of the world probably should imitate. But de Tocqueville kind of looks at the constraints that exist on exporting this idea. That in fact, as Professor Downs already pointed out, the United States was very fortunate in the, uh, in the circumstances of its creation. The United States was relatively isolated from the rest of the world. There were no major military enemies on our borders. Uh, even uh, the Native American population uh, posed a threat to the frontier settlements, but to the country as a whole, not so much. The United States was also uniquely blessed in having a large continent with uh, many, many resources that uh, they could use to increase the wealth of the country. And perhaps, you know, maybe spread out a little bit more to more people so you'd have less social, less social conflict that way. So again, it's um, difficult for, for Tocqueville to agree that this idea of the uh, American experiment is going to work outside of the confines of the United States. And again, this is a real difference between the two, uh, between the two books on um, this, particular aspect of, this particular aspect of the American character. One of the other places where we see a real difference is in the role of religion in the American character. The Federalist Papers are virtually silent on the question of religion in public life. There's almost nothing said in there about it at all. And in fact, this really shouldn't be a surprise because the Constitution itself is virtually silent on the role of religion in, in public life, too. There's a little section in one of the later articles about uh, not having to take a religious oath to uh, have, a job of, uh, have a job under the United States Constitution. But that's really it. And again, the Federalist Papers, which were designed to defend the Constitution, have almost nothing to say about this um, as well. Democracy in America, on the other hand, has a lot to say about this question of religion. And virtually everything that he has to say about it is positive. In fact, de Tocqueville says uh, explicitly that religion uh, in public life is one of our most democratic institutions, and one of the institutions that supports uh, the uh, democracy in the United States. Again, de Tocqueville is coming from France, which at the time was a very Catholic country. And as a lot of writers in the 19th century were pointing out, uh, the Catholic Church was very heavily hierarchical, uh, everything very, very much top down from the center. And his experience with religion in, in France was very much, again, it's a centralized sort of faith. You know, again, very much a hierarchical, almost authoritarian faith. De Tocqueville comes to the United States and sees exactly the opposite experience. He finds congregations in the United States not just being run democratically among the lay people, but also voting on and picking who their clergy are. And this is a, an utterly radical notion for de Tocqueville. It's like, what do you mean that you pick who your celebrant is? And this is, you know, someone in the central office has to do that. But uh, most American churches at the time didn't work that way. Uh, again, they, they, not only, um, they not only got to participate in the governance of the church, uh, that they belonged to, but also they chose who their uh, clergyman was. And again, this is a very strange. This is a very strange idea for him. Again, for de Tocqueville, religion becomes part of what keeps democracy going in the United States. Um, and partly this is because of the separation of church and state in the United States. But mostly, he says, it's because you have democratic control of of the churches. This becomes another democratic institution, even for the uh, Catholic churches in America, that those are far more democratically run uh, than in, let's say, France or, or in the rest of Europe. And again, this is, this, is a, this is a shocking revelation for, for de Tocqueville. One of the other big differences 
between the two between the two uh, documents is on the need for group formation. So for down, as Professor Jones has already put it, the Federalist Paper have you know very negative connotations about group formation. In fact, one of the most famous Federalist Papers, number ten, is all about the evils of faction and how we need to shut down these small groups that are only interested in their own thing and uh, how the United States will avoid faction because it's a large country and how this is all good for democracy. But Tocqueville, on the other hand, it's, it's, all, about, it's all about the groups. This is, one of the unique, um, this is one of the unique generative functions of American democracy is that we can create these groups to uh, organize and get stuff done uh, in, our, in our government. And it's all very positive for the Tocqueville. Again, very, very contrasting views of uh, what the role of groups should be in a, in a democratic country. Finally, uh, again, another, another uh, this is a sort of a negative part of the American character, kind of American experience, which is the idea of race and how this has been played out in, um, the, how this plays out in both books. Again, the Federalist Papers have almost nothing to say about race in the, United, in, in the US. There's one Federalist paper that talks about the three-fifths compromise, and it's obvious that the authors are very uncomfortable about it. You can see that the, you can see in the writing that okay, we know we know this is we know this is a clunker, but we have to defend it because it's part of the Constitution. And again, this mirrors the silence of the Constitution on the issue of race. Remember, uh, the word slave doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution. They use all the circumlocutions to get around it. Same is true in the Federalist Papers. However, again, in one of the most read parts of democracy in America, the issue of race is taken on directly. Okay, uh, full front, full front, big chapter, many, many, many uh, dozens of pages talking about uh, the the again the three races that make up uh, the United States and his and his observations about that. Okay, since I am actually uh, running out of time, I just want to make one last point and then pass it off to, pass it off to my colleague. The question, I think, of both books is, uh, can the American character, can the American experiment survive? Both of the books are very positive about, uh, very positive about this idea. Federer's papers ends on a very hopeful note. It's like, we're going, to, we're going to actually do this, but there are still people out there who oppose us. There are still people who threaten the uh, American experiment, and so that's why you've got to ratify the Constitution. Democracy in America does so, too. But he sees some serious problems on the horizon, again, mostly dealing with, with race. And actually, I wonder whether he would say the same thing about interest groups, too. There's a, there was a very interesting book written about 10 years ago called Bowling Alone. And I love the, I, I, I love the title of the book because you uh, get a kind of a chuckle about bowling alone, right? But that was the, it basically was the observation about how organizational life in the United States has decreased in the last several decades. If for de Tocqueville, uh, the the unique genius of America is the, uh, our ability to create groups and get stuff done. What does it say about the society and American democracy that uh, fewer and fewer groups are being formed, even in a place like bowling leagues? OK, as we have just talked about, um, part of the American character is our ability to shape our society and form our world, our government, to how we like it. And that is kind of what I'm going to go into to discuss the student organizations of the 1960s. Um, let me just get this started. I just have some slides to, okay. As my paper will demonstrate, the new left was breaking convention in the 1960s. However, they were still struggling with where women would fit in in their new society that they were trying to form and create. The icon of the new left, Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS, was an activist group formed from the student division of a socialist organization from which they later disunited. Um, in 1962, Tom Hayden drafted their political manifesto. It was called the Port Huron Statement, and it called for a participatory democracy and increased student involvement in the formation of our government and society. We, the people of this generation, bred in at least modest comfort, housed now in universities, are looking uncomfortably to the world that we inherit, end quote, during the first line of the manifesto. During the first years, SDS began to cooperate with Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which emerged in 1960, 
um, SNCC, if you will, called the Beloved Community, was a youth faction of the Civil Rights Movement whose goal was to combat Jim Crowism in a nonviolent manner, also to um, increase voter registration and to desegregate. The two groups, however, were not breaking conventionality in the terms of sexism. Sex and Caste was a memo written by Mary King and Casey Hayden about the women's roles in both organizations. It declared, having learned from the movement to think radically about personal worth and abilities of, the, of people whose role in society has gone unchallenged before, a lot of women in the movement have begun trying to apply those lessons to their own relations with men. White women from both SDS and SNCC found themselves unable to participate along with men in organization and administrative duties. Furthermore, their involvement in the move, as their involvement in the movement progressed, women found their roles in SDS and SNCC, in fact, emulated the sexist inequalities which society as a whole suffered. White women found their roles in SDS and SNCC largely defined by domestic and secretarial work, and sometimes as subservient objects of sex. Since the beginning of both movements, women held very different places in SDS than, and SNCC than did men. White women were excluded from all executive positions, limited to traditional female roles, in, and in SNCC, black women were included in the executive and leadership duties However, the white women were not and still restricted to the secretarial work. In SDS, the politics were radical. However, the rigid ideas of femininity in the 1950s were still thriving. In one activist account, quote, movement women found themselves playing a secondary role on every level, be it in terms of leadership or, in sim or simply in terms of being listened to. Their roles ended up concentrated on food making, typing, mimeographing, general assistance work, and as a sexual supply for their male comrades after hours, end quote. In Robin Morgan's 1970 book, Sisterhood is Powerful, the author said of her experience in the SDS, quote, thinking we were involved in a struggle to build a new society, it was a slowly dawning and depressing realization that we were doing the same work and playing the same role in the movement as we were out of it. Typing the speeches the men delivered, making the coffee but not policy, being the accessories to the men whose politics would supposedly replace the old order. But whose old order? Certainly not ours. As women were enthralled with the excitement of de developing this new society, they realized that they were what they were creating was going to only change the lives of men. Women were expected to play the su supportive role as the gallant woman who typed this speech and made the coffee, but not the policy. At first, this was something one did not share with her comrades. But as the movement went on, the hypocrisy became, became more and more apparent. In a speech given in Washington, D.C., SDSer Carl Oglesby defiantly spoke out about the government's upholding of labor's rank and file. Yet in his home organization, labor's rank and file was flourishing. Further, the Port Huron statement boldly declared, although our own technology is destroying old and creating new forms of social organizations, men still tolerate meaningless work and idleness. One wonders what was going through the head of the person, most likely a woman, who was to type out these speeches. In contradiction to what was said, the women in the SDS were absolutely expected to tolerate idleness of work. Linda Dauscher remembers, quote, the resistance was so idealistic, so romantic. The main thing that dominated was the whole thing of going to jail. Oops. It really scared men and at the same time put them on a pedestal, like you're really going to give it your all. And this complicated the whole men and women issue. If that's the way to oppose the war, there was no way for a woman to. Mimi Feingold, who also worked in the movement, became immediately turned off to the role that women were playing in the resistance. Here was a movement where women were playing the most unbelievably subservient role, because women couldn't burn their draft cards, couldn't go to jail, so all they could do was relate through their men, and that seems to be the really most demeaning kind of thing." End quote. The way women were expected to contribute to the Stop Draft campaign, 
was spelled out in posters which stated, girls say yes to guys that say no. <laughs> this is precisely the role women were supposed to, or the way in which women were supposed to draft or protest the draft. During the Freedom Summer of 1964, many white women, particularly women, members of the SDS, answered the call to volunteer for SNCC and with all levels of organizational experience, migrated south to help. And an account from In Our Time, two women, Jan Golden and Susan Brown Miller, who were both volunteered in politics for years, were met with this response after enthusiastically raising their hands when asked who the volunteers were. Shit, I asked for volunteers and they sent me white women, end quote. <laughs> This mentality led to the initial anonymous writing of the position paper from the November 1965 SNCC conference in Waveland, Mississippi. The paper was later to be named Sex and Cast, a kind of memo. There seem to be many parallels that can be drawn between the treatment of Negroes and the treatment of women in our society as a whole. But in particular, women we've talked to in the movement seem to be caught up in a common law caste system that operate, operated sometimes subtly, forcing them to work around or outside hierarchical structures of power, which may exclude them. Many people who are very hip to the implications of a racial caste system, even people in the movement, don't seem to be able to see the sexual caste system. There are, oh, I'm sorry. Um, when present, when the question is raised about women, there, the response is said, that's the way it is supposed to be. There are biological differences. Or other statements which recall white segregationists confronted with integration. The statements made here are very bold in that they oppress, or that they criticize the oppressed for oppressing others and articulate undertones of reverse racism and are expressed disdain, disdain for the hierarchy and SNCC. The paradoxical situation made by those who were hip to the implications of a racial caste system were not willing to integrate white women fully into their movement. Hayden and King articulated their point very well by showing similar claims of, of white segregationists on the basis of biology. Black women and members in SNCC tended to perceive their situations differently than the white women that volunteered. In response to Hayden and King's paper about the treatment of women, Cynthia Washington, which this is, um, oh, the one, sorry. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I mess up. This is Cynthia Washington. Um, in response to the paper, she said, um, what, what they said didn't make any particular sense to me because at the time, I had my own project in Mississippi. A number of other women directed their own projects as well. We did the same work as men, organizing voter registration and community issues with men." End quote. Not only were the black women in SNCC able to lead their own projects and work with the men, they were also significant founders and executives. In some ways, they even made men feel as though um, they were not in power. Washington goes on further to say that one of the male members told her that men felt superfluous. End quote. Black women were more than participants, but also important contributors uh, and often the ones in control. Perhaps the economic differences for black women who were working to change the realities of their own lives led them to see the movement with greater seriousness. While the white women's social and economic status was not directly affected by the civil rights movement, they were allowed some degree of frivol in the greater context of society. Some white women were inspired to leave their homes and their jobs as housewife, housewives to help in the cause. While black women were still working towards the economic ability to choose to be solely housewives or to volunteer outside the home. By the time the movements were in full swing, the sexual revolution had made quite an impact after the Food and Drug Administration passed the birth control pill. The sexuality of the youth culture could be attributed to how historians Maurice Iserman and Michael Kazin described the youth environment as surrounded by one's peers, largely free of responsibilities of the career and family. Women in the movements were free to fulfill any sexual desires that may come upon them. However, in the two movements, one could observe very different circumstances. 
Women in the SDS were expected to say yes to guys to say no to the draft. And in SNCC, white women were expected to say yes or risk not proving their opposition to racism. Relationships between men and women in SDS were strongly linked to the sexual revolution after the, and the in conf conflicts that it engendered. Some believe the revolution exploited women. As historian Sarah Evans points out, quote, men expected women to adopt their sexual promiscuous standards, end quote. Tom Hayden, president of SDS, agrees, quote, the early movement of the 60s inherited, a deepened, inherited and deepened the climate of a male-dominated permissiveness. The movement was a chauvinist paradise. The positions of power were dominated primarily by men, and the opportunities for under, unequal sexual liaisons were legion. On the other hand, Deirdre Eng English believed that not all sex was exploitive. The sexism was there, but women were actually having more sex, sexual experiences of different kinds and enjoying it. Women were having more sex and it was not procreational, and claiming the right to do it as well as paying a lower social cost." End quote. Men and some women were basking in the ability to enjoy freedom from social stigma and limit the possibilities for pregnancy while increasing their sexual relations. Some women enjoyed the freedom to have sex like men with no assumed commitment thereafter. On the other hand, some women were disillusioned when they found the climate in SDS was built around the increased ability to have sex imply commitment before moving on to your next assuming conquest. To many in SNCC, White women developed reputations for being promiscuous, a stigma that complicated their relationships with both black men and black women. In Sex and Cast, Katie Hayden wrote, the problems with relationships between white women and black women, there are problems between relationships be with white women and black women, end quote. These problems were, again, whether they were to take advantage of their newfound freedoms or if they were to be exploited by a male-dominated sexual revolution in which the possibility for black and this is the possibility that black women perceived as the truth, end quote. The two expanded on their point. Women seem to be placed in the same position of assumed subordination in personal situations too. It is a caste system which in its worst uses and exploits women, end quote. However, the accounts of what happened vary according to the perspectives of observers. Um, some paint pictures of hordes of loose white women coming to the South and spreading corruption wherever they went. One male observer recounted that white female volunteers spent the summer, most of them, on their backs servicing not only SNCC workers, but anyone else who came along." End quote. Yet an, uh, an alternate view was offered that men were the sexual aggressors. Sarah Evans argues that, quote, every black snake worker, with perhaps a few exceptions, counted it a notch in his gun to have slept with white women, as many as possible. A white woman activist in the Freedom Summer thought, quote, women found it much harder to say no to the advances of a black guy because of the strong possibility of that to be taken as racist, end quote. White women were the observers of the civil, civil rights movement. They did have something to prove and possibly in some cases became too involved to do so. This may have lent pressure on them to show just how racist they were not. Historian Alice Eccles suggests some women even pressured, were even pressured to show their loyalty. Alternately, the climate of the 1960s was that of rebellion and liberation from social norms. It's very possible these sexual li liaisons were more than mutual and instigated freely by both men and women. Hayden and King distributed their paper throughout the SDS around a year after they had originally written it. Workshops and conferences were set up to deal with the women question and were not successful in either SDS nor SNCC. In SDS, women were pelted with tomatoes, dragged off this platform in addition to being laughed at. In SNCC, Women who had problems in, with their position were told exactly where their place was in mocking rhetoric. Backlash by men in the SDS was significant. However, the women were exhilarated by their meetings. Marilyn Webb remembers the discussion groups galvanized enormous numbers of women endlessly. I don't even remember anything else that happened at the convention. We always used to talk about other people's problems. This is the reason it was so incredibly interesting is that the first time we applied politics to ourselves, end quote. Our political awareness of our oppression was 
developed through the last couple of years as we sought to apply the principles of justice, equality, and mutual respect with which we learned from the movement to the lives we lived as part of the movement, only to come up of, against this, a solid wall of male chauvinism. The men did not meet the women's call for change with open arms and open minds. Conferences and workshops ended in women staging walkouts and forming their own groups that allowed for a free exchange of ideas. Tom Gitlin describes the women's involvement in the conferences as the heckling of a representative of the women's movement on an anti-war platform. Tom Hayden describes the workshops, quote, I found these meetings to be torture sessions. <laughs> Men went to morbid meetings in which we were we, in which we explored why males were oppressive and given to ego trips, end quote. Not only were the men mocking in tone, upon further examination of the SDS manifesto, one could see the, the hypocrisy considering comments in the Port Huron statement on society's fear of change and protests such as this. For most Americans, all crusades are suspect, threatening. The dominant institutions are complex enough to blunt the minds of potential critics, and entrenched enough to swiftly dissipate or re entire repel the energies of protest and reform, thus limiting human expectancies. Ironically, the man who wrote this inspiring testament to increased human expectancies was not able to extend these changes to gender roles and admits in retrospect, quote, I hardly received a mature edu education about women as friends and lovers. In Catholic tradition, Eve was both dependent on Adam and his temptress. A man's purpose was to enjoy, but not be basically distracted by relationships with women, end quote. It is odd that someone could be so astute in societal criticism, then himself abolish all need to adhere to his hopeful policies of modern society and hold so tightly to the story of Adam and Eve as it was more legitimately based than their government. Sex and caste acquired an infamous backlash in SNCC as well. What is the position of women in SNCC? The position of women in sick is prone, said Dopely Carmichael in a meeting prompted by the paper. <laughs> Marilyn Webb, a writer for the New Left Notes, once said, Our enemy is not man, but an oppressive system that pits group against group. The oppressive system that had effects in all dynamics of SDS and SNCC. In the SDS, white women were held to traditional expectancies of femininity as far as their menial tasks which were in most cases the extent of their contribution. Not often were their voices heard, were they able to lead their own projects, make speeches, nor policy. Their silence was surely, limit, surely limited the richness of the organizations and left it androgynous in nature. In SNCC, the efforts of white women were again limited, and therefore the passion to prove themselves given the circumstances, circumstances were such that they did have something to prove and their desire to help would have lent diversity to the organization. In both organizations, the opportunity for sexual exploitation was great, which serves as a reminder that even those who claim to be promoting equality and freedom can still be caught within the web of their own gen engendered prejudices. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is David Schuster, and today I'm going to talk about the American frontier and the shaping of the American character. Now. I teach history. That makes me a historian. And uh, as, a, as a history professor, I always stress the importance of thesis statements with my students. If they do not have a strong thesis statement in their paper, their paper is not going to be very strong. Today I want to talk to you about the most famous thesis statement in American history. It's the frontier thesis. And as a history professor, I hope someday that maybe I will know someone that will be able to create a thesis as influential on the creation of the American character as the frontier thesis. Now, the story of the frontier thesis uh, in American history goes back to 1893. See, in 1893, there was a, um, a World's Fair being held in Chicago. It was called the World's Columbian Exposition. And uh, the American Historical Association gave a special uh, conference, a special panel discussion, much like we're having today in which various historians talked about their understanding of what it means to be America. Uh, a historian from the University of Wisconsin, a fellow named Frederick Jackson Turner, uh, gave his paper. And it really shook up the historical profession. Because what Turner did with one paper 
is change the way Americans conceived of themselves and change the way Americans understood the development of uh, American society and the American character. The paper was called The Significance of the Frontier in American History. Again, the paper itself was called The Significance of the Frontier in American History. In it, he argued, and this is the thesis, that what made America quintessentially American was our long interaction with the frontier. France did not have a frontier. Germany did not have a frontier. Or if they did have a frontier, it was a few thousand years before. Uh, Great Britain did not have a frontier. But the United States, we had a frontier. Constantly, from the very first time the Puritans arrived in Plymouth Rock and started moving westward, or the first settlers settled in Jamestown and moved westward, there was always a struggle of Americans versus something out west, the frontier. Uh, to quote Frederick Jackson Turner, the man that came up with the frontier thesis, he stated, quote, up to our own day, American history has been, to a large degree, the history of the colonization of the Great West. The existence of an area of free land, its continuous recession, and the advancement of the American settlement westward, this explains the American development. Now, what was the frontier? Well, you see, that the frontier was actually a technical designation of land in which does not have much people. Uh, but according to the census um, of 1890, uh, America had become so thoroughly populated that, uh, that we no longer had a frontier. And this is what led to the development of the frontier thesis. Uh, it was the frontier which brought out various aspects of the American character, according to Frederick, ja um, uh, 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 according to Turner. He stated, quote, to the frontier, the American intellect owes its striking characteristics. And then Turner goes on to explain a lot of these striking characteristics. These include that coarseness and strength combined with acuteness and inquisitiveness, that practical, inventive turn of mind, quick to find expedience, that masterful grasp of material things lacking the artistic but powerful to affect great ends, that restless, nervous energy, that dominant individualism working for good and for evil, that wherewithal, that buoyancy and exuberance which comes with freedom. These are the traits of the frontier or traits called out elsewhere because of the frontier according to Turner. So Turner was talking about these laudable traits of the American character. Ingenuity, individualism and self-reliance, toughness, optimism towards the future. But he also was talking about these more questionable traits of the American character. Uh, that the Americans lacked an appreciation for the artistic and that there is a, a gray area where Americans do not quite understand or maybe differ on what is right and what is wrong. Now, these were not entirely new ideas. Obviously, as we've heard already on the panel, to uh, de Tocqueville talked about individualism. Um, the Federalists talked about also how Americans can disagree on issues. Uh, now, one of the reasons why this frontier ma thesis made such a tremendous splash in 1893 is, uh, is because it came at this point in American history where it looked like America was struggling to find some sort of identity. Now, historians up to this point had, subs had subscribed to what was called the germ theory of American history. And the germ theory of American history is essentially that what, Ameri what, what, what caused Americans to develop was this almost genetic-like uh, um, um, attributes that we have. Most Americans uh, were considered to be these Germanic Anglo-Saxon people, and that American society just followed suit, that whatever made Anglo-Saxons great in Europe then was transported to the United States and helped develop our own nation, the American character. But in 1893, with the frontier thesis, Turner gave a different understanding of what makes America great. It's not because we inherit it through our blood from Europe, but it is something unique that all Americans, white or black, uh, Anglo-Saxon or Irish, could experience. Um, now, in addition to this idea of supplanting this germ theory, and making it uniquely American. Um, you have to understand that in 1893, this was a mere 28 years after the Civil War. Uh, America was still divided. That's, that's one generation after the Civil War, which really divided our nation. And it was a, a mere 16 years after reconstruction of the Civil War, which most people would agree was a failure. So it seemed as though the Civil War created a great cleave within our society, and reconstruction never did much to really heal that.
Along comes the frontier, though. Frederick Jackson Turner, with his frontier thesis, explains to Americans why we are one country. We might have been divided by a civil war, but it was our frontier which brings us together as one unified nation. Southerner, Northerner, Westerner, Easterner, all are united into one nation because it is the frontier that makes us Americans and U.S. citizens. A very powerful idea. Now, as I said before, uh, the cause for this frontier thesis was the fact that in 1890, the American census found that we no longer had a frontier. This means that after the exuberance which comes with learning that the frontier makes us Americans, Americans also learn that we no longer have the frontier. Now this creates a, a kind of a crisis of identity to, a, to an extent because what makes us Americans and what makes us great no longer exists. So what's going to happen to us as a nation? Without the frontier, are we going to degenerate into this European-like power? Are we all going to live in cities? Are we going to lose our rugged individualism? Are we going to become effeminate urban population? This, this, this was a crisis. And uh, it wasn't something which historians are looking back on and saying, oh, there must have been some sort of crisis of the frontier at that time period. No, this was something which people at the time sensed was happening. Um, in 1890s, the majority of Americans still lived outside of cities. But within 30 years, by 1920, it becomes clear, according to the new American census in 1920, that uh, Americans now, the majority of them, are living in cities, you know, far away from the countryside, which supposedly made us great. What you see develop then, what you see develop in the 20th century, after the frontier thesis came out, and after people realize the frontier is no longer there, is you see that America starts to generate a, a new type of frontier. The, the, the frontier is not so much a literal physical frontier out west, but it becomes more of a frontier in our popular culture, in our minds, um, in the stories we tell, in the books we read, in the movies that we watch. The frontier moves into popular culture in the 20th century. And what's fascinating about this is that once the frontier moves into popular culture, um, each generation of Americans can redefine what the frontier means. What's more is you have this larger issue that you see when you start observing the frontier in the 20th century about to what extent does art, does this popular culture imitate life? And to what extent does, does life actually start imitating this popular culture, um, the iconic frontier of, of, let's say, the Western films that develops in the 20th century? So what I want to do is I want to take a few minutes and I want to go through uh, some of the popular icons associated with the frontier. And we can see how America's concept of the frontier uh, changes with time. The further we, we get away from the actual frontier of the West, uh, uh, the, the more we start to see this kind of constructed frontier in our popular culture. I like to call it the romanticized West. Uh, once we no longer have an actual frontier, we start to romanticize what it meant to be part of the frontier. This, of course, the first image we see right there is a, is a snapshot of Buffalo Bill's circus. Um, you'll see uh, Indians, you'll see cowboys, you'll see some men and women all around a stagecoach. It's kind of like the greatest hits of what it means to be out west. Oh, of course, uh, I don't want to give short shrift to Frederick Jackson Turner. There's a picture of him. He himself is a, project, uh, is a product of the West. He grew up in Wisconsin. He got his, uh, his degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, which at that point was out west. Um, he taught as a professor in Wisconsin for many years, and then he moved on to Harvard, the, uh, the, the bastion of Eastern sensibility. And just to remind us all what the West was about, I want to just reread very quickly kind of the key quote from Frederick Jackson Turner. To the frontier, the American intellect owes its striking characteristics, that coarseness and strength combined with acuteness and inquisitiveness, that practical, inventive turn of mind, quick to find expedience, that masterful grasp of material things lacking the artistic, but powerful to effect great ends, that restless, nervous energy, that dominant individualism, working for good and for evil, that wherewithal, and wherewithal, that buoyancy and exuberance which comes with freedom. These are the traits of the frontier, or traits called out elsewhere because of the frontier. See, 
Fairly quickly in the late 19th century, Americans realized there was something important about the, about the frontier. And popular culture in the United States uh, starts to reflect that. You see this in the romantic art coming out of the West. Albert Bierstadt, for instance, very, very famous artist in the 19th century. And by the end of the 19th century, his art becomes even more popular, more expensive, as Americans realize that even if you live in a city like Philadelphia, and you're never going to go out west, you can capture the essence of the west in a painting by Bierstadt. You are not a, a, an art gallery of note unless you had romantic art like Bierstadt in your galleries by the turn of the 20th century. So even if you couldn't go out west, you can stand in front of it, a picture like that, and kind of experience the West, and maybe somehow um, inherit some of that rugged individualism of the West. And even if you couldn't go to an art gallery, you had popular artists such as Frederick uh, Remington that would, uh, well basically he made a living creating images of the West that would be found in American magazines and journals uh, in the late 19th century into the 20th century. So you didn't have to be high culture to experience the West. Um, popular culture, almost from the very beginning of the late 19th century, could experience the West as well, vicariously live it. And of course, out of the West, out of the West arose mythical figures. Interesting that these figures gained more legendary status once the West had closed than when the West was still alive. Figures like Billy the Kid show that even a kid could be a, um, a powerful figure out West. The James Gang. Uh, Frank and Jesse James, for instance, uh, became almost heroes. Frank James claimed that no jury in, in the world would, uh, would find him guilty, and it's true. When he went to, uh, when he went to court, he was tried for murder twice, uh, the jury found him not guilty both times. And the Wild Bunch, of course, uh, uh, Butch Cassidy, Sundance Kid, you know, they, they were able to claim the imaginations of Americans. What's interesting is that all three of these groups, Billy the Kid, James Gang, the Wild Bunch, outlaws, but they were not nasty men. Within the mythology of America, they were kind of folk heroes of sorts. They were Westerners. And of course, as you have uh, outlaws, you also have the, uh, the law, the heroes of the law out West. People like Calamity James, Wild Bill Hickok, uh, Stagecoach Mary, Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday. Now it's interesting that while a lot of these villains, so-called, social bandits out West were heroes, a lot of law people out west had reputations of being very grim individuals. You know, Wyatt Earp was not known as a warm and fuzzy man, but he was a law man. Law out west uh, wasn't always uh, kind. And of course, out west you have a, a whole other uh, um, group of heroes, folk heroes, so to speak, that arose. Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, Geronimo. Um, these, individual, these individuals, these Native Americans, uh, entered into the lexicon. Uh, and, and people that lived in the northeast and eastern part of the United States. Uh, they reminded Americans that even if you live in a big city, uh, you can play you know, cowboys and Indians, and not everyone would want to be the cowboys. Sometimes it was fashionable to be the Indians as well. And of course, if you lived out in the east and you couldn't go to the west, sometimes the west would come to you. Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, for instance. In the 1880s, it became all the rage. Um, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show even took their show over to Europe. They performed for Queen Elizabeth at her, excuse me, Queen Victoria at her Jubilee. And believe it or not, one of the star attractions of the Wild West show was Sitting Bull himself. <laughs> Sitting Bull himself joined the circus and went out to the east, discovered the cities of, the, uh, of, of, of Europe and also Eastern Seaboard, and again, introduced Americans to the west. John Muir, of course, wrote. He was a naturalist that lived in the West Coast of the United States. Uh, he would tramp around the Sierra Nevada mountain range, and he would write about the West. And he was so influential, he was actually able to get, uh, he was one of the main movers and shakers in the development of the National Park Service, setting aside forests. And of course, for politicians, Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt went out West in the 1880s to overcome a, a nervous breakdown that he had, and he returned to the East Coast politics as a cowboy. Uh, and of course, the rest is history. Americans love the iconic cowboy politician. Now, now we get to the 20th century. Now we get to a situation in which Americans really start to romanticize what it means to be out west, vicariously live in this frontier which had closed. Um, Owen Wister's Virginia, known as the very first Western novel, 
um, in American history. It really established the Western genre. You would not have Zane Grey or Louis L'Amour if it wasn't for Owen Wister. And of course, what was America's first major film? It was a Western theme, The Great Crane Robbery. You know, of all the different topics that American cinema could choose to make the first film, it's a Western train robbery. There's something about that. Americans know the West is closed, but we want to relive it in our films. By the time we get to the 1930s, you have the, uh, the rise of the singing cowboy. Um, Gene Autry, Dale Evans, and Roy Rogers. Uh, these are nice, warm, fuzzy cowboys. Uh, they're basically reinventing what it means to be a cowboy in the 1930s. Uh, of course, we saw cowboys like Jesse James. Uh, we saw um, people like Wyatt Earp. By the 1930s, the American cowboy becomes this quintessential patriotic figure, and also one that has entertainment, which isn't all that surprising. The 1930s was the time of the Great Depression. So if you can combine cheap entertainment with this iconic American figure, then what you're doing is you're combining two different aspects into one quintessential American character, which is the cowboy. By the 1950s, a cowboy starts to change. Uh, the Roy Rogers type, it gets a little more grit in him. Uh, they become John Wayne type characters, and also the Lone Ranger. You're not gonna hear John Wayne singing or the Lone Ranger singing. Now why are these characters, why are these Western figures uh, so important to the 1950s? Well, you have to remember the 1950s height of the Cold War with the United States. The United States was a standoff with the Soviet Union. So it's not surprising that these iconic Western figures are these protectors, people that will stand between uh, the American community and someone who's evil, who is out there. Remember the 1950s was also High Noon, Shane, these type of really uh, you know, lone cowboys that are gonna protect American virtue. They're patriotic characters. And of course, by the 1960s, by the 1960s you have uh, Clint Eastwood become the iconic cowboy. He's not like John Wayne. Clint Eastwood didn't have a name. He's known as the, uh, you know, the man with no name. And in the Sergio Leone films, like A Fistful of Dollars for a Few Dollars More and The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, um, he's not an altogether patriotic character. He has moral ambiguity. He does things which are good and bad, but he's a good spirit. He, in many ways, represents, he represents the counterculture of the 1960s. That is willing to go against what is expected but at its heart is still good and still American. And of course, by the 1980s, you have Ronald Reagan that becomes the iconic cowboy figure. Now, Ronald Reagan is an interesting figure because he goes back to the 1950s type cowboy, the John Wayne type figure, and combines it with politics. Um, and this way, he is, he is both Teddy Roosevelt and John Wayne all rolled into one. And, uh, and so Americans, when the Cold War, uh, 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 once again became a, a, a topic of discussion and headlines in the 1980s. Americans like to take faith that, uh, that John Wayne was there at the rudder. Excuse me, I should say Ronald Reagan was there at the, uh, you know, guiding the ship of state. Now, something we've got to ask ourselves and what I'm going to end on is the uh, most latest uh, uh, icons of the American cowboy. And uh, I think it's fascinating that when um, G.W. Bush was first in office, and when he was talking tough after 9-11, people would often make him out to be a cowboy. But it's interesting, you don't see him depicted in political cartoons as a cowboy anymore. Because as his popularity has gone down, and because it's become more and more clear that he's made maybe some poor decisions and poor planning in the aggressive things that he's done, um, people have taken the cowboy image away from him, as if he didn't deserve it anymore. But I'm going to let historians maybe 20 years from now comment more on that. So that's all I have to talk to you about today. Remember, Frederick Jackson Turner, frontier thesis, <coughs> development of the American character. Uh, always have a strong thesis when you write papers for university <coughs> professors, because that's what we love. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Um, does anybody have any questions for the panelists? I had a question about Alex Utopal. Yes. Um, did he come to America and become an American, or did he come here like to do some research on the American experiment. How long was he here and why did he write Democracy in America? Well, he actually came to the United States to write a report on the American penitentiary system. <laughs> uh, and then once, once that was done, 
he realized that he had discovered a lot of really interesting things about, about the United States. And so he returned to France and wrote the two-volume book, uh, democracy in America that kind of summarized what he saw beyond what, what he saw beyond the prison system, but yeah, his he was officially here on on work, and then realized wow, there's a lot more going on in this country than I had originally anticipated, and so I'm gonna comment on that. Anybody else? I got I got an oh. observation. If no one else wants to go, no, I, I'd like to go, <laughs> please. <laughs> uh -oh. Um, uh, and I will use my power as a, as a as a moderator, I guess. Um, I had I had two questions, and so I, the first question I had was actually for Elizabeth. Um, again, as somebody who um, who's not an American historian, one of the things that really struck me about your presentation was I was um, was the sort of the, f the the focus on the role, the very special role that one white women seem to play within these two organizations that you talked about, and tremendous amount of emphasis of sort of their you know their horizontal position and their and, and the extent of their contribution to it. And I'm curious to what extent um, this kind of depiction of these white women in these organizations. Um, is, is in some ways as, as being sort of as um, uh, you know as being promiscuous um, as being purely there to uh, to service the men was part of a way to discredit them to discredit these idealistic women who um, you know who took who stepped out of their comfort zone and who did all you know who, who went through a lot of trouble uh, for the sake of ideals and you know and their beliefs um, and yet I mean it's a, it's a it's a very effective way to completely discredit any anything else that they may have wanted to accomplish or anything else that they actually um, could have accomplished. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point because um, the women that went from SDS, Casey Hayden and um, Mary King, they went to go help out with SNCC and as they were not feeling very appreciated in SDS, they then went to go try to help with the civil rights movement instead. And I think that probably is a very good assumption that it was a way to discredit the women, to keep them in their feminine roles, doing the typing out the papers and the speeches and um, making sure everything was set up for the men to succeed and to get their point across. Also in the fact that they even, the women first went to that, went to SDS to become part of their organizations shows that they were semi-idealistic in nature and really wanted to, you know, express that in some way and help out and, you know, show themselves and then they were expected to say yes to the guys who say no and that was pretty much the extent of what they were doing is it is it um is it interesting that it seems that the promiscuity accusations were primarily levied against white women and not the african american women the african american women didn't have the same experience with the um the being objectified because they were out there with the men doing the executive positions they were um there were i think three of the founders of the eight founders were women um, it was initially started by a woman. The first um, meetings were started by a woman. So they didn't have the same role as the white women did. They did go to jail. They, as we saw from one of the pictures, they were getting arrested. And so it kind of gave them a different vantage point to be looked at. I do think it's interesting, as we talked about the American identity, we almost all discussed it in, in a somewhat positive uh, light. Liz probably did the best job of not being so positive about it. One of the characteristics mm -hmm. that you see, whether it's women in, in your case, you, uh, Craig mentioned the three-fifths rule. We could talk about Native Americans, especially Andrew Jackson, the father that he claimed to be of Native mm -hmm. Americans. We have this tendency to dehumanize people in order to keep them from being seen as equal. Since we we have in our governing documents all men are created equal, and at one point in time we wanted it to be just really white men. Uh, and now we try to have this broader definition of men, but we've we have a history of trying to dehumanize the other so that they can't be equal. Absolutely. And now, I, my other question is actually um, for uh, for Professor Schuster. And um, again, as a not as not an American historian, um, and as somebody who specializes in the Soviet Union, um, I tend to have perhaps um, a slightly less triumphalist approach uh, approach to history. And so, of course, Frederick Jackson Turner is somebody who's so famous that even non-U.S. historians have heard of him. Um, but I was really, I guess, I, I was I was very struck by 
um, the presentation of, um, of Turner's argument because you, you juxtapose the germ theory, which, which you presented as a very exclusive, that is, it's the Europeanness in, in the Americans yeah. that makes them great, versus the, um, the, more exclu uh, the more inclusive argument that Jackson Turner makes, but it seems that there's, there's, some very, there's some very dark and also very exclusive things within the frontier argument. First of all, the, um, the statement itself, I mean, in some ways, uh, to go back to Professor Down's point, right, the idea that the creation of America was a product of its time, in many ways, Frederick Jackson, Jackson Turner's thesis is also very much a product of its time. Um, when it says that it's more inclusive because anybody who gets to go to the frontier, um, you know, gets to be an American, it excludes a very important group, one of the three races that Professor Ortzi mentioned, the Native Americans. They are not part of that group that becomes American as a result of being on the frontier. In fact, there seems to be this view of the frontier, even this idea that it's a dense, not a densely populated area, kind of this Blake Slateness of it all, right? It becomes the frontier when the few Europeans show up and the way that they encounter this, um, you know, the, the, the area that they, the area that they encounter. And so the, the mythologizing of the frontier, the view of the, sort of the cowboys as the quintessentially positive, positive figure really marginalizes kind of the other side of the frontier, right? Presenting one of the first movies um, being about, um, um, about cowboys as as the or you know as as this perception of American is what about another early American movie, The Birth of a Nation, a much 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 more narrow and exclusive view of what it means to be an American. So I'm just curious about the triumphalism inherent in this particular argument. Yeah, it, it, it was. I mean, Turner really did. It was a triumphant type thesis. And uh, personally, I think that the that that the frontier has been more influential after the fact than it was actually during the fact, and in, in the sense that we talk about in popular culture. Uh, but it's interesting too that you that you mentioned specifically Native Americans because you know his frontier thesis is happening six years after a policy called the Dawes Act in 1887. Now the Dawes Act sought to reform federal policy towards Native Americans, and it sought to basically get rid of the reservation system and make all these Native Americans U.S. citizens and little family farmers. Uh, so it, it turns out the Dawes Act was a was an incredible failure, unmitigated failure, uh, but. At the time, there was a lot of people that thought Native Americans embody the frontier, embody the West, and perhaps they can help invigorate what it means to be American. Uh, you know, so you, you even think of people such as Sitting Bull. Sitting Bull was there at, at you know, the Battle of Little Bighorn, um, but he was also there and accepted with Buffalo Bill Cody's circus. When he would show up in Philadelphia and New York, we're talking about Sitting Bull here, some people might boo him, but people were almost in awe. There was still this idea of, uh, amongst, you know, prevalent in America, that, that, that the Indian makes a noble enemy. It is, they are a noble type savage. There are the idea of that, you know, they could be sneaky and stuff like that, stereotypes. But for many people, Sitting Bull was not a dastardly character. Once he was part of the circus, right, and a decorative object to be paraded around as no. part of the presentation of and, the West. And once the once the federal cavalry had the Native Americans under their thumb, you're right. You're right. There there is this again romanticization of of, of all this going on. But there's a romanticization of that going on even in democracy in America. You get the yeah. feeling that the that that the Indian is the the ultimate free person, and that goes all the way back yeah. to. Uh, John Locke, who you were talking about earlier too. So I mean, it's not just it's not just romanticization again after they've been defeated, but there's also this romanticization uh, ahead of that. That again, they are uh, that they are the uh, the the, uh, the ultimate free person. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a, yeah. It's not like Turner and people were taking making something out of nothing. They're right. building it all on everything that Tocqueville was saying mm -hmm. and, and Locke, etc. Is that a question in the back there? Yeah, you're done. I'm done. Okay, my question has to do with the American character today, given what you guys have discussed. Um, for instance, uh, you've discussed the importance of the American frontier in changing the American character, and Craig, you discussed the importance of exporting, right, this mm -hmm. uh, new, I think, very important um, aspect of the American character, which is that democratic character, right, and exporting it. But um, there's an undercurrent that I feel of um, this imperialist undercurrent of mm. importing this wonderful idea of democracy, but it does to me have a, an imperialist undercurrent in the likes of, you know, the way that Spain, uh, England, France, and Portugal also had this idea of expansion, 
in the you know, uh, 16th and 17th century. Um, and um, I realized, you know, that it is different, you know, um, but my question is, uh, does the exportation of democracy have a redeeming value given the fact that there is a process, can, there's an invasion and imposition and the presence of army, can the means actually achieve the ends, you know, when it comes to the importance of who wants this one? Who wants to, who yeah, wants to take this one? I'm looking over I'll take the first stab, and then the rest right, of you, uh, you can I'll think while I'm taking second. the first stab. Uh, part of the difference between what the, the, the framers and, quite frankly, even today, some people would say the, the difference is that uh, when England, when Spain, when France, when they were trying to expand, in some respects they were doing it out of what they believed to be some sort of divine right that was perhaps even God-given or somehow just from a lineage standpoint given. And the difference was that we believed we were doing it, and today still do, do believe we're doing it, out of some greater um, uh, set of natural laws, out of some philosophy that is better than just some belief in, in a divine right. Rightly or wrongly, I think that's probably the best, the shortest answer to that question. And I think it's a pretty good distinction because the founders uh, really did uh, specify a difference between some divine right versus a philosophical basis where pe the, pe the power is in the hand of the people. Doesn't make it right. I'm just saying that's the explanation. Well, and the, other, the, other, the other hard part to argue would be the reverse, which is say our dictatorships are not having freedom better than having a free society. Well, almost no one's going to say otherwise unless you're a you know, hardcore fascist or something like that. You would, you would, never, you would never say that. And so when when the idea comes up of, of of exporting this idea to other countries, it's it's it looks like an unalloyed good. And so that's it's much harder to reject that than, than to reject straight up imperialism, which is like, oh you have stuff, we want that stuff and we're gonna take that stuff. And and the the idea of American exceptionalism is just one of these irrational aspects of our politics and our society. I mean, ever since the very beginning, American are exceptional. You hear even in political rhetoric, you know, politicians say we are the greatest nation on earth. Um, you won't hear German politicians say Germany is the greatest nation on earth. You won't hear other politicians. They'll say we are a great nation or we are a great, you know, we are, we are good, but not, not that we're the absolute best out of all time. Americans, you basically have to say that. If you don't, kind of shows that you don't love America as much as others. Mm -hmm. So it, it's part of also political culture, cocksuredness. Well, of course, you're, there, you know, Germany has in the past made, the they, German politicians they in the past have, have made those they statements, have, although that had somewhat, you know, also very dramatic consequences. And absolutely. That is why they're no longer allowed to say that anymore, um, <laughs> this, in polite company. This, this, is, this is one of the reasons why, again, this whole exporting democracy thing becomes complicated yeah. because I mean, Germany is now a successful democratic regime, and how did that happen? Well, that happened because of World War II, and it basically flattened the entire German society down, and kind of the, the U.S., along with its allies, basically rebuilt it from, uh, at least politically anyway, from that from that flat uh, flat surface. Well, those are just scary. There's, there's some scary, scary implications of um, of that success story. Right. For, uh, well, but <laughs> future, but in the but in the in. There's been a lot of discussion in the democratization literature that this is one way that you can that you can successfully export democracy is that you basically start with a blank slate. And I, again, I'm not saying this is right, wrong, or otherwise, but this that goes is along with that. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Well, I have one more, and so this is uh, perhaps, a, and if I do say so myself, I think it will be a good question to um, perhaps end the, um, the, our discussion on. Um, Professor Ortsy brought up the sort of the importance of um, Tocqueville's Democracy in America as a document where you have an outsider coming in and uh, observing the United States and then writing this definitive book about what it means to be, a, a, what it means to have democracy in America and what Americans really are like. So the question is, do we need another one? Is it time for another one? Is it time for somebody else to come in and perhaps, um, you know, just look at us, observe us, describe us? Huh. Well, it has. I mean, it's it's been tried. Uh, I think by uh, filmmakers um, uh, from other from other countries that try to come in and like capture the, you know, what what they see as quintessentially American. But a lot of Americans look at that and say, well, you as an outsider can't possibly know, so why don't you just pack up the cameras and, and go home? Uh, or, they, or they perceive it as being excessively critical. Um, 
that uh, this person's coming out and pointing out all the flaws and, and, and none of the and none of the good stuff. So it would be difficult for someone to do what what Tocqueville did. Uh, and I think the, the the way that he was able to get away with doing it was that he got most of his criticism out of the way in the in the penitentiary <laughs> report. I mean that was very very highly critical. Uh, and then most of that stuff is left out. And yeah, there are criticisms of of the American system in, in terms of again the the treatment of the other races in uh, in the United States. But for the most part, it's kind of this. The whole book is kind of this tone almost of like fascinated out it's like wow look at this new thing and I'm going to explain why this is so new and so and so cool so you you would almost need somebody like that to to write a, a similar book and I guess if an outsider can't do it, it it puts the burden on us the Americans to be a little more self-reflective and look at us more closely if we want to think about what we are and what we should um, true and shouldn't be doing um, if there are any aren't any more questions perhaps this is a chance for the panelists to maybe make a couple of final statements maybe about one and a half two minutes each um, if they want to um, as a way to comment add uh, before we wrap up we're starting and at that end we're going to start at that end so you guys have a chance here's your chance i used to be an impromptu speaker in high school so i'll give this a go <laughs> now first of all i just want to tell everyone well thank everyone for for showing up also i want to remind people that for the next 10 minutes the remnant trust exhibit is still going to be open so we're going to try to wrap up here fairly quickly i suggest if you have not seen the remnant trust exhibit um, hustle down to the library and if you get in there by noon they're not going to kick you out so you can spend an extra 15 20 minutes probably there uh, looking at the exhibit um, in general though the shaping of the american character i i think what the important issue is uh, is is how important our popular culture is to shaping the american character we can take an idea like the frontier thesis and every generation take the icon of the frontier and reinvent it through cinema through fiction etc so in that way our idea of what it means to be American is dynamic, it's protean, it's always changing. Uh, is there a there there? I don't know, but uh, you know, I, I like studying it. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, that gives history its, its zest. Okay. Um, I guess in closing on the American character, I'd like to just bring up the fact that we're so diverse and that we have come along in this evolutionary process where we have included everyone through protest and then we slowly get everyone involved and we've come to be this big nation where everyone just kind of works together and we you know represent groups from all over the world and I think that that's an important part of our culture and our character that we should always think about and incorporate into our days. I think that I think the last thing that I wanted to make about the American character is that this is something that has both been a constant in American history so that you can read things like Democracy in America and have these eureka moments where, wow, that's exactly like what's going on in politics today and he's writing this you know, 160, 170 years ago. But also that the American character has, her character has changed, at least some of the flaws that the Tocqueville talked about have been tackled, not completely. Uh, by uh, people in the United States, but uh, at least these, these issues are uh, finally being addressed today. I think that exceptionalism is a good thing. I think you should be proud of yourself. You should be proud of where you're from, but it also comes with a heavy responsibility to be much more introspective than some of us have been. And it's events like this that will give us the opportunity to do that, uh, both in, in forums like this, but also our research should not fail to be introspective as well. And so we have diversity and we have American character as a work in progress is perhaps um, some of the defining features of the American character. So uh, thank you again for, uh, for coming today.